Well, good morning once again. Welcome to Hope. Uh, if we haven't met just yet, my name is Mike. I'm a pastor up in Appleton. It's great to be with you as we kick off this brand new series called Sad Songs. Uh, I dare you to sing Pharrell at a funeral. Have you heard that song before? You know, his infectious hit, Happy. I, I triple dog dare you to walk up to any widow in her moment of grief and say, I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss, and then just start humming. <laughs> now, you wouldn't do that, would you? Because you actually have tact and character <laughs> and you're smart. Uh, because you know uh, that as much as the human heart wants to be happy, there are some moments in life when Pharrell just doesn't seem to fit. Isn't that why we find so many sad songs on the radio? I mean, they don't just exist, but they climb the charts, people request them, because there's something in the moment of sadness that resonates with our life experience. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember Eric Clapton. I had a hit song called Tears in Heaven, a song about the death of his young son who fell 53 stories to his death. And people didn't just listen to the song, they requested it because his mourning connected with their own grief. Some of you remember R.E.M.'s classic, Everybody Hurts. That was sang by millions and millions of people because they could resonate and relate to the hurt. Uh, we all know deep in our hearts that there's some times when we want to sing a sad song. It's what our souls actually request. And, and apparently that's not such a bad thing. I just came across this uh, study the University of Chicago did in 2014, and, and here's what they concluded. That listening to sad music can lead to beneficial emotional effects such as the regulation of negative emotion as well as consolation. Apparently, it can be beneficial to listen to the most heartbreaking songs. Uh, wasn't that uh, what the movie Inside Out was all about? And if you see that, spoiler alert, okay, I'm about to ruin the movie for you in case you haven't seen it, so cover your ears. But the whole thing is that as infectious and lovable as joy is, if she's at the control of our emotions all the time, we, we miss it. And sometimes we just have to be okay for sadness uh, to take over the controls. And that's why I'm so glad we find the sad songs of the Bible. Uh, because way before the University of Chicago published their study, way before Pixar made that movie, the Bible was telling us that it's good to be sad. Uh, a king named Solomon, about 1000 BC, said there is a time to weep. The prophet Isaiah said that when the Savior would come, he would be known as a man of sorrows, like we just sang. And when Jesus came on this earth, even though he was filled with the joy of God and the Holy Spirit, he one day went to a funeral and he didn't sing and whistle. Now, John 11 says that Jesus wept. And in fact, that, that's a theme that we find throughout the songbook of the Old Testament, the book of Psalms. There are songs in that book that are dark, that are depressing, uh, that are borderline suicidal. Songs when God's people are crying out, I believe in you, God, but this is hard and you have to help me. And I love the fact that God put that in his word because that means we have a place to go. Uh, on the days when Pharrell doesn't fit, when we're broken and depressed, when we cry when no one else is around, there's a place that God has given us to turn and that's where we're going to turn. For the next four weeks, we're going to look at four of the saddest songs in the book of Psalms. That we would be prepared for the darkness that is either happening right now or in this world of sorrows is going to come upon us soon. Now, you might not laugh, you might not smile as much as you do during most sermon series, but you will be blessed as God gives you a place to run, a place for your soul to hide and have a good cry that cleanses to the very depth of our being. Now today, obviously, we're kicking off a series and we're going to study uh, one of the songs that's called Psalm 32. And I think that all of us can relate to this song because all of us have, have been part of what inspired it originally. And some of you remember the behind the music specials on like uh, VH1. Well, the behind the music of this song is a topic all of us are familiar with. Uh, all of you have been through it. And I'm guessing lots of us uh, right here this morning are going through it right now because the inspiration for Psalm 32 was deception. Telling the truth, but not telling the whole truth. 
Uh, Giving a little bit of the story that we want people to know, but keeping most of the story to ourselves. Misleading people about what really happened. That's what the song is about. And I say that most of us can relate to that because I'm guessing you haven't been completely honest when someone asked you this question, how are you? And if life was hard and things were broken, I I bet that you didn't start to say things uh, like this. Well, I had sex with my boyfriend two hours after the sermon where Pastor Jason told us that that's not God's will. Uh, I weighed myself six times this weekend and forced myself to throw up twice. I lied to my doctor just to get pain meds. Uh, I cut myself when my parents aren't home. We had a fight on the way to church, but we smiled when we saw the greeters at the front door. A married man flirted with me on Facebook and uh, I didn't exactly tell him to stop. Twelve years ago, uh, I had an abortion. I resent her for getting the promotion and I didn't. I hate him for making the team when I got cut. I thought about killing myself. I don't know if I believe in God anymore. Now, when those things are going on, we don't exactly admit them. Instead, we say, how am I? I'm, I'm fine. Yeah. And, and you? We just push play on Pharrell's hit and we try to act happy. Now, I, I realize I don't know many of you personally, but, but I think that this church is probably a lot like my church. As I was getting ready for today, I decided to page through this. This is our church directory. Just names and phone numbers and email addresses for about 300 people. Uh, It's the size of our church. When I read through, skimmed through this list, I tried to write down all the the tragic, heartbreaking things I could think of. I mean, I I don't know half of what people are going through. They don't exactly tell me always their deepest, darkest secrets. But in a list of 300 people, here's what I found. Um, That she is divorced and he's addicted to pornography and they're lonely, alcoholic, depressed, eating disorder, bipolar, chronic pain, abused, anxious, addicted, divorced, 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 broke, scared, separated, traumatized, confused, miscarried 12 times, separated, widowed, abused, abused, horrifically abused, addicted, PTSD, chronic pain, alcoholic, sexual struggles, eating disorder, eating disorder, molested, abused, debilitating pain, cancer, suicidal, cutter, alcoholic, abused, ashamed, porn, 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 grieving, overwhelmed, struggling with sin. That's our church. That's the church people. And if we would just stand up and sing happy songs all day long, we'd be hiding something. We we wouldn't be telling the truth. And I'm feeling lots of you here today, even if you love God with with a passionate heart, are in the same place as so many people that I call my brothers and sisters at our church are. So, so why do we deceive? I mean, if, if that's happening at pretty much every church in America, why, why do we say we're fine? And, and I think I know, I think there are two reasons. Um, re- really the big reason is our first fill in the blank for today, that we think that if we sing this sad song, if we tell the whole depressing, sinful story, we believe that sad songs will make us sadder. And if I turn this mic on and I just told you all of my drama, all of my sin, all of my struggles, all the embarrassment, all the shame, I mean, what would you think of me? How many of you would avoid me in the lobby after church? Keep your children far from me. How many of you would be concerned? Would my good name, would my reputation be gone? And that's why we're not honest, right? We have the opportunity to in church, at a small group Bible study, but we think if these people know there are going to be consequences. They're going to look at me differently. You know, I'm supposed to be the manager of the company. I'm supposed to be a leader at church. I'm on staff at, at the church. If they knew, man, I would not be happy. Or maybe sometimes we don't sing the sad song because we kind of like the sin. We know that if we come with a broken heart to God, it means we're going to have to change and we kind of like living together before marriage. I kind of like having porn to turn to when my intimacy with my spouse is not great. 
You know, I don't want to take ownership for the sin that I've committed, so I want to point a finger and blame it at him. We, we think that we're going to miss out. We think that we're not going to be happy. We think that we, we couldn't rejoice if we confess the deepest, darkest parts of our heart both to God and to other people. Well, today, today King David wants to sing to us. Because King David did that exact thing. He, he thought he'd be happier if he just sang a happy song and said he was fine. Now, th- today, here's what David wants to do. In Psalm 32, he wants to convince you that singing the saddest, most raw, real, repentant confession of who you really are and what you've really done will bring you the greatest joy that you can fathom. So for the sake of your happiness, for the sake of the joy that lasts more than just the show and the cover-up, you have to listen to the lyrics today of David's song. Now, uh, do you know much about David? I know we come from different uh, kind of backgrounds spiritually. David's pretty famous in the Bible. He lived about a thousand B.C. He was the king of Israel and, and it's not too much of a stretch to say he was like the, the Justin Timberlake of his day. The uh, Bible says that David had the looks, he had the ladies, uh, David had the fame, and David had the voice. He was known as a brave warrior, an incredibly wise ruler, a captivating singer. But we're about to find out that David was also a wretched sinner. In fact, at one time in David's life, he managed to break almost all of the Ten Commandments at one time. Um, it, it all started when David was up in his palace and he looked down into the city of Jerusalem and he saw a drop-dead gorgeous woman naked. But instead of averting his eyes, David stared. David lusted. And the lust clouded his vision. He didn't see the ring on his own finger he chose to ignore the ring that was on hers. David, the rock star, told his security team to, to get that woman and to bring her backstage. And you can imagine what happened in the green room. Uh, they hooked up and David thought it was over. But then she sent word back to the palace, I'm pregnant. And that was a problem. I mean, because David wasn't just the king, he was the king that went to church. He wasn't just the guy who read the Bible from time to time, he was the guy that God chose to write parts of the Bible. And now he was an adulterer and he couldn't hide it. But he tried. You know, David thought, if, if, if I sing that sad song, if I tell God, the world, that, that I slept with uh, another man's wife, there's going to be consequences. I'll be so sad. And so he tried to cover it up. Um, he, he called the woman's husband home from war. He was a faithful soldier and a passionate believer in God. He tried to get the man to go home and to sleep with his wife. You know, maybe the world would think that the kid was his. Maybe the, the, the people of Jerusalem wouldn't notice David's features on the baby's face. He tried, except it didn't work. And then David did the unthinkable. He had the man murdered. A brave soldier fighting for his country, fighting for David, and David had him killed to cover up his sin. But you can't exactly admit that after church, can you? Hey, how are you? Hey, let me tell you about my weekend. Um, so David lied. He stuffed it down. He covered it up. As far as I can tell, he kept going to church. His pastor would ask him, hey David, how, how are you? And he would say, I'm fine. And you? I mean, he idolized his image. He misused God's name. He trampled on the purpose of worship. He broke the laws of the land. He murdered, committed adultery, stole, gave false testimony, and coveted his neighbor's wife. David broke almost every commandment in one season. But here's the thing he didn't do. He refused to sing a sad song. He didn't confess. But we're about to find out that God wasn't into David's tune. The God of truth is not okay with deception, hypocrisy, and cover-up. The Holy Spirit would not grab bass and play in this cover band. God sent a prophet to King David. I'll tell you more about that next week. But, but here's what you need to know for today, that finally, thankfully, mercifully, David 
confessed. He uncovered his sin. He got real with other people and he got real with God and he wrote a song about it. And it's a song meant to convince you that if you have a dark, deep spiritual secret that you think is going to make you happier to keep inside, you have to listen to the lyrics of David's song. Check this out, Psalm 32. David starts by saying, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. David's talking about blessed people. I'm I'm guessing you all want to be blessed, right? Uh, Blessed is just a Hebrew word that basically means happy. And he says happy people have four things going for them. Uh, Number one, he said, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. Uh, Transgressions are those kind of sins where God draws like this line in the sand and you look at it for a little bit and then you go, Now, when you knew better, you weren't naive or ignorant to the Bible passage, you just stepped over God's line, you rebelled against him. David says, I am so blessed and we are so happy that God forgave those kind of sins at the cross. And not just that, number two, blessed is the one whose sins are covered. And we say, yes. (laughs) I mean, if all of my sin was uncovered before the eyes of a holy God, if he thought about all the things I've done, it would make him so angry, he would have no choice but to condemn me to hell. But I'm blessed because my sins are covered. When Jesus gave his life on that rugged cross, he covered every sin with his blood so God smiles on his people and we can rejoice. We say amen. Third, he said, blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them. And we say, yes, (laughs) I'm blessed because of that. You know, I walk into God's courtroom, there's the, the devil with stacks of evidence, proof of the things that I've done and said and thought, the motivations of my heart. Satan starts accusing and God the judge says, no, I'm not gonna count that. Now the jealousy, not going to count that. The pills, the pride, the porn, all the peas, all the letters, all the evidence, none of it counts. You're free. Go in peace. And we say, yes. (laughs) That is the happiest song of my entire life. But then, but then, David gives us number four. He says, and, and blessed is the one in whose spirit is no deceit. And that's where we scratch the record and say, whoa, whoa, wait, whoa, whoa, wait. (laughs) Like, I'm blessed, I'm happy when there's no deceit. Like, the truth and the whole truth. David, you're you're trying to tell me that I'm going to be happier if I bear the darkest, deepest, dirtiest parts of my life to God and to people. David knows that when we read that, we're not going to be convinced. We're not going to request that kind of song. And so he, he continues and, and look at what he says in verse 3. He, he knows we're going to hesitate. So he says, when, when I kept silent, when I tried to deceive, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of of summer. When, when David tried the cover up, it looked like he was tricking the world, right? I mean, before the sin came out, he looked happier, but he admits actually inside, my bones rotted. Like sin, my sin was chewing at the marrow of my soul. And my conscience was groaning all day long. It was, it was roaring like a hot mic in my quiet moments of prayer and worship. Because God's hand was heavy on me. God was being heavy-handed with David. He refused to let his conscience be okay with his sin. I mean, David would hold this little baby, the, the product of his adultery, and God would make him remember, you sinned. And David would grab his guitar and he would try to play, but God would stab his conscience, you sinned. He would go to church and just see a random prophet or a member from his congregation and, and God would, would force him to remember, you're not like them. You're, you're not sorry for your sins. God was pushing down with a heavy hand of mercy. He refused to let David be okay with his sin because God did not want David to be lost forever. See, here's what David is trying to teach us uh, in these verses. 
He says that if you don't sing a sad song, that you will not be happy for very long. If you think life is going to be better because you keep the secret, David says, no, no, no. God won't let it be. His hand will be heavy on your conscience. Something will, will feel off in your soul. And I, I wonder uh, today if some of you know exactly what David's talking about. If some of you get pretty nervous uh, when you're with Christian people because they might ask the question about, about that. Maybe some of you have stayed away from churches for a long time because you thought if, if they if they knew, and I'll have to keep this a secret, but something wasn't right in your heart. Maybe some of you have close Christian friends or you go to a small group Bible study and when it's time to like be real and talk about the highs and lows of the week, you don't go as low as you need to go. But, but David's saying, now you feel it, don't you? God's hand heavy on you. He loves you too much to, to let that sin fester in your soul. He cares about you too much to let that cancer spread and so he's going to force you to remember that something is not right deep within me. So he says, sing a sad song. And we say, but we can't. David, what, what would people say about me? How, how would they look at me? I, I can't sing that sad song but, but David says, wait, wait, wait. Before you object, before you object, I want you to listen to this. Verse 5. If you don't remember anything else from today, just remember this verse. David sings, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Here it is. And you, God, forgave the guilt of my sin. Oh. Man, you know, four times David says, I acknowledge my sin did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions. You forgave the guilt of my sin. He's, he's owning everything he did. But, the, but then he says, and I wouldn't believe this unless it was in the Bible, he says, and you, God, forgave the guilt of my sin. <laughs> and if God was up here on stage with me, I would be like, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. God, you're going to forgive just like that. I mean, he confesses, like, same verse, boom, you forgive the guilt of his sin. You're not going to kick him, kick him off the label of Christian records. You're not going to boot him out of the family. He's just forgiven. And if God were here, he would say, yep. <laughs> and I'd say, no, no, no. But, but God, do you remember what David did? I mean, he, he didn't play one wrong note. He trashed your law like a Guns N' Roses hotel room. I mean, murder, adultery, cover-up, abuse of power, the, the things that are scandalous that would make the front page of our news feeds. That's what David did. You're just going to forgive that just like that and God would say, yep. And I say, no, 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 God, but, but not David. I mean, he didn't just do that. He lied to your face about it. Now, how many of you just show of hands are parents here today? D tell me what, what's worse when your kid does something bad or lies to your face about it? I mean, I mean we, we can have mercy on the kid who says, Dad, I messed up. But the kid who looks at us and says, no. I mean, it's like, no, I know you're lying. I know the truth. David did that to God for a year. And yet when he finally came clean, God didn't say, hey, you had your chance. I put my hand heavy on you. It took you this long. No, he immediately forgives the guilt of his sin. I wouldn't believe it unless I read it, but God is shockingly merciful. And I want to tell you today, God is the same way with us. I mean, you think God's going to be mad. You think he's going to be disappointed. You think he couldn't accept you, couldn't look on you with favor and give peace deep in your heart and David is telling you, don't believe that for a second. Your addiction to pornography, the cutting, the abortion that you had, the divorce you went through, the anxiety that you're, you're battling, the, the mess that you call a marriage, I don't care what it is, it wasn't worse than David and God will surprise you with how fast and furious, he forgives the guilt of our sin. Yeah, and that's why David bursts into the bridge. He, he, he's thinking about forgiveness. He can't help but sing. Look how he finishes Psalm 32. He says, therefore, here, here's my conclusion. Let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You, God, are my hiding place. 
You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Then he kind of breaks and he starts singing to us, to the congregation. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. <laughs> you know, David says, many are the woes of the wicked. So pray to God while he may be found. There is a hiding place of grace and shocking mercy and compassion. You don't have to hide from God because of your sin. You can hide in God from your sin. <laughs> I love David's lyrics. He says, don't be like the horse or the mule. Like, don't be a dumb person. I mean, like, <laughs> you can be spiritually naive and stupid and run away from church and Christianity and from God himself because of your sin. He says, don't, don't do that. Your woes will only increase. God will not let you alone. But here's what you can do. You can confess. You can pray to God the most honest and real prayer and here's how it's going to end. God's unfailing love will surround you. You, you will rejoice. Here's David's big idea that happy people sing sad songs. I mean, we assume as humans, if I, if I sing this song, if I admit this, it, it's going to get worse, I'll be sadder. David says, no, 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 I tried that. Here's the thing, in the end, happy people sing sad songs. That's what Pastor uh, Max Lucado found out. Some of you have read Max's works, pretty prolific Christian author. Uh, Max grew up in a family that had a history of alcoholism. And so he knew he didn't want to drink. I mean, not at all. He didn't think it was sinful to have a beer, but for him, it was just a bad idea. He, he didn't want to tempt his predisposed genes. And for years and years and years, that's exactly how he lived. 0, 0.00. But then one day, for some reason he still can't explain, he got the itch. Uh, he, he wanted to taste alcohol. I mean, not, not get hammered like a rock star. He just wanted a beer, but... He felt like he couldn't drink a beer at home because then his family would find out. And he didn't want to drink at a bar or a restaurant. Maybe he'd run into a member of the church. And so for a week straight, Max found himself in a gas station parking lot drinking a single beer each day out of a brown paper bag. A pastor. And it tasted so good on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. But Friday, as he, as he cracked open the can, he felt the heavy hand of God. He was a hypocrite. It wasn't wrong to drink, but it was wrong to do what he was doing and he, he, he couldn't let it go. The beer was bitter in his mouth. And because he knew about David, Max knew what he had to do. He threw out the rest of the beer. He called the church leadership team. He gathered them together and he sang a sad song. Your pastor, he said, is a, is a hypocrite. I'm hiding my sin. I've embarrassed myself and God and our church family. And the church leadership team listened and then, and then an old member, gray hair, reached out a hand and he put it on Max's shoulder. He said, Pastor, what you did was wrong. But what you're doing is right. And God's grace will cover your sin. And that day, Max learned that King David was absolutely right, that happy people take time to sing sad songs. So let me ask you this morning, do you want to be happy? David says there's a way to do it. Let's sing. Let's sing the truth. Let's admit the whole story. Let's not hide it from God. Let's not hide it from other people. David says, I know you're afraid if you would talk about the cutting, about the jealousy, about the insecurity, about the alcohol, about the drugs, about the way things really are in your home. I know you're so scared, but don't be. God is a hiding place and there's room in that place for you to hide.
too. God's unfailing love will not fail you. It didn't fail a guy like me. David says you need to sing a sad song. So are you ready to do it? Well, let me give you a little help since I heard only one yes and about 400 <laughs> deaf silence. Let, let me give you three really practical ideas that will keep your heart honest towards God and to other people. I'm going to save the best one for last, but here's the first one. That you could choose to do a Lord's Prayer pause. Uh, many of you know the Lord's Prayer. Uh, if you don't, it would be worth memorizing. Uh, and many of you pray the Lord's Prayer frequently. Uh, I like to pray the Lord's Prayer in the morning on my way to work. What, what if after that one line that talks about forgiveness, you would pause and sing a sad song? Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. Pause. God, forgive me for sins like, like the websites, um, like the way I treated my family before I left for work, uh, like the grudge I've been holding against my sister, punishing her even after you've forgiven her. God, I had the chance to help that guy, but he was homeless and needy and it was messy. God, forgive me. What if you got in the habit of not just praying the prayer and reciting the words, but pausing long enough to sing a sad song to God? Or number two, what if you would journal your confessions? It's a quick show of hands today. How many of you are journalers? You write something down every day? I see a couple of hands. I'm not sure if I see many guys' hands. All right, I'm going to out myself. I'm a, I journal at night. Guys, if you're judging me right now, I don't need your approval. I believe in Jesus, so I <laughs> have his already. But I journal. It's so healthy for me. And, and not just because I write down like, the memories of my kids that I would have forgotten about or the great things that God blessed me with. But at the end, I just write three lines. I say, God, thank you for. God, help me with. And God, forgive me for. And I stare at that, at that journal and I make myself think, what happened today? No, I don't want to stuff this. I don't want to hide this, God. I want to be real with you. It's just an intentional way that my sinful nature can't cover up my sins. I want to get real with God each and every day. But here's the best one. What if the next time you were with them, you would confess both to him and to them? What if the next time you were with a close Christian friend that you trust or you went to your small group Bible study, here's what happened, that you would show up and not Facebook you. Y'all know what Facebook you is? Like, <laughs> I look terrible when I wake up, but I put makeup on, Chick selfie, hey, let's put that one online. You know, the kids are literally killing each other in the pictures, but we Photoshop them, they look like they're in love. Hey, let's put that online, here's my family. That's Facebook you, right? We don't want the world to see how we actually are, but what if, what if you would use the people of God to help you with the things of God? What if when you got together and someone asked you, how are you, you would just be spiritually raw and, and real? Do you, know, do you know why I want you to do that? It's because in my experience as a pastor and as a person, it's only when we do that with other people that the habits of our sinfulness really change. You see, a sinful habit is like the stool and we bring it into our life and we pray, God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me for this and he does. And we're cleansed and we're righteous and we're holy in the sight of God. But, but I've found that, that I can't lift this, my sin, out of my life by myself. But I've seen again and again and again when people say, hey, this is embarrassing, but mm, that brothers and sisters in Christ grab a corner and, and we lift this out, out of the habits of our soul. I, I work with a ministry called Conquers Through Christ that helps people who are caught up in the, the wreckage of pornography. And can I tell you, every story I have of someone who gets better is because of that. And men and women who are crushed, guilty, ashamed, they are so repentant, so sorry, they confess to God every day and nothing changes for years, sometimes for decades, until, until, until they say, hey, would you help? They sing the sad song at open mic night and they let the people of God know. And you know what happens? Instead of people saying, ew, like, disgusted with you, they say, let me help you. I'm going to pray for you because God's Holy Spirit lives in those people to help us with the deepest, darkest parts of our life. Oh, y'all are going to have a fun week here at Hope. 
And let me prepare you. If you're on the other side of that confession, here's the very first thing that you say. The very first thing. You know that God loves you, right? When we're so intensely vulnerable once the secret is out, once we expect the awkward silence, you be the person in the room to say immediately, you know that God loves you, right? And we'll carry this burden together because happy people sing sad songs. I know many of you are so scared to do that. <laughs> you're going to be nervous the next time you get together for a group. You're going to be like, I hate that pastor from Appleton. Why does he make us do these things? And that's why I'm going to leave you one last time with, with David's words. He says, blessed, happy, is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them. And blessed and happy is the one in whom spirit is no deceit. Blessed. It's what you want to be, isn't it? Then let's sing. Let's sing together even if our song is sad. Let's pray. God, it is so hard to believe that you would forgive a man like David, but you did. And when I look in the mirror, it's so hard to believe that you would forgive a man like me, but you have. Everyone here today who is in Christ, who looks to Jesus and his cross, is is perfect and we can rejoice because you are rejoicing over us in this moment. Not over a future version of us, but right now who we are in Christ. I pray that you would draw anyone who doesn't know Jesus in this room to him. Who, who else is going to treat us and our mess like you do in your grace? And I pray for the weeks and for the years to come. Uh, may this church be the kind of church where it's okay to not be okay. May these people be the kind of people who aren't filled with a spirit of judgment but the spirit of mercy and who are as patient with the brothers and sisters around us as we want you to be with us. I thank you, God, for this sad song and I thank you for the happiness to which it leads. So help us to sing, to confess, and to praise you for being a God of shocking grace. We pray this all in Jesus' perfect name. Amen.